Greetings, this is lecture three for the anthropology of Asia. The topic of this lecture is South Asia and Indian diversity. So in the last lecture, we started to talk about disaggregating Asia, um, by which I mean sort of rather than thinking about Asia as just this one big simple unit, we're actually beginning to break Asia up into different regions. And as we shift now to South Asia, I think it's nice to take a look again at that South Asian geographic region. You see in this map, they, they've highlighted Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. You do see the two uh, Himalayan countries, Nepal and Bhutan. Uh, there are other countries as well. We could talk about Sri Lanka. We could talk about the, the Maldives. Some people would include Iran uh, in South Asia as well. A lot of continuities across the border between Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan. And so we disaggregate India as well. And you can talk about different geographical regions of India. Northern India is really interesting, especially if you want to think about uh, the change uh, of India, the development of India through, through time up to the contemporary period. If we're thinking about India as a geopolitical state, it's uh, linked to some of the very earliest states in the world. The Indus River Valley, which is in today in, in Pakistan, is one of the world's earliest states. And with the uh, in-migration of people from the southwest part of Asia for uh, Central Asia, they move into northern India at the same time, really, that, that that early state begins to decline and collapse. And by 500 CE, a new state sort of emerges on that Indo-Gangetic plain. And so it's from that period of time that we begin to have uh, the, you know, a concept somewhat connected to what we would have today, where we can think of something uh, such as India, right? The kind of con country, state, society that we could call India. It's this early um, state in northern India. Now, in northern India, you still see many different disputed regions. So just like that uh, early state conquered the Indo-Gangetic Indo Plain, the co contemporary state is also dealing with territorial issues in the north. You have disputed regions like Khalistan, which is uh, the kind of border region between Pakistan and India. You have Kashmir in the very north um, of India, near the Hindu Kush Mountains and the Karakoram Mountains. You have uh, disputed control between Pakistan and India there as well. You have Aksai Chin, which is controlled by China, but is uh, claimed by India. And so we have a number of different disputed areas. So you have some concept, right, of, of North in India, kind of based on the Indo-Gangetic Plain and the Himalayas. And in contrast, we can also think about another region of India, the, the south of India, particularly the p peninsula, right, that you see uh, there on the slide. And this is important for a number of regions, not only reasons, not only is it a different region specifically of India, but like we saw at 500 CE, the formation of a state in the, the north, well, we can think about how late the, the south of India was really incorporated into that political entity. So South India was only brought into India in the 17th and 18th centuries. An important um, feature of India to really understand uh, the diversity of experiences of people you know, living there. South India, we can also just draw your attention to the Bengal Sea, the Bay of Bengal, uh, which you're gonna have the Brahmaputra River flow down into the Bay of Bengal. You see Sri Lanka very clearly in the slide. And then if you look really lightly, the fainted kind of dots to the west of the peninsula, that's the Maldives. That's the island country of, of, of Maldives. Of course, the Maldives and then the west coast of India is on the Arabian Sea. And that's been very important for Indian history because you've had long-term trade, culture, economic uh, relationships between India and Middle Eastern countries, as well as the coast of East Africa. Long-term uh, trade that goes back into the ancient world. So in addition to Northern India, Southern India, 
we should talk about Eastern India. Eastern India is a really interesting part of the country and it's really distinctive. Uh, it is complex topographically. Uh, you have, if you look at the map there of Northeast India, you'll see Assam province, which is more or less the uh, river valley, the Brahmaputra. And so on its western end, it's going to flow down into Bangladesh and then down to the Bay of, of Bengal. You'll see Bhutan and Sikkim, very high altitude, mountainous Himalayan uh, region. And then you have those border areas, Mizoram, Manipur, Nagaland, all kind of classical areas of, of Eastern India. Other people will include Bihar, Jharkhand, West Bengal in this you know, Eastern India region as well. What's particularly notable, I think, about uh, this, this region is the fact that it was only incorporated into the political entity of India very late in the 18th century. So this came with British colonialism that these areas now, what are these provinces of India really came to be part of that country. In addition to the easternmost provinces, you also have that Bihar, Jharkhand, West Bengal area that is up on the Chota Nagpur Plateau. In fact, Bangladesh really is centered around the Brahmaputra River and so is a kind of eroded lowland area, if you will. And as you go east from Bangladesh, right, you're getting up into uh, more mountainous terrain in that border region. Likewise, if you go east out of Bangladesh into Bihar, Jharkhand, and West Bengal, you also move up onto that Chota Nagpur Plateau, also higher elevation um, region. So once we've kind of disaggregated the concept of India a little bit, we want to kind of also think about the disaggregation, right, of the population from thinking of just Indians living in India, right, to the actual human diversity of the, the region. And so we can start by thinking about the Hindu majority. So about 45% of the population, a little bit less than half, would be considered this ethnic majority. And those are distributed all throughout the country. It's an interesting category because it is a religious ethnic category and it includes a huge range of different language families, many different cultures. Uh, many distinct social groupings. So for example, we can talk about the caste system, uh, the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, the Sudras, and these other caste groups. Uh, we can talk about the different language and linguistic identities of these groups, the Bengalis, the Marathis, the Gujaratis, and so on. Uh, we can talk about the example of Tamil and other Dravidian language speakers and writers, let's say, in the south of India. So after you understand the kind of Hindu majority, the Indian government also denotes what they call scheduled castes. And so even though we have this ethnic majority that is Hindu, there are also minorities that are also Hindu, these scheduled castes, if you will. Uh, and this comes out of sort of post-colonial India. It's taking of a, a democratic track and the development of things like affirmative action. So there are these officially recognized disadvantaged groups. The scheduled castes include what you may have heard of the Dalits or, or untouchables. And this is a, a, a huge population, almost 20% of the national population and made up of a thousand and more different subgroup, subcast kinds of groups. Like the majority as a whole, they are also distributed all throughout the country and are very, very culturally and linguistically diverse. So in, in addition to these Hindu uh, caste groups, the Indian state also recognizes what they call backward classes. And this is about 25% of the population. So also a very significant large group of people. For the backward classes, we're really talking about these minority religious groups like the Sikhs, Muslims, Jains, as depicted in the slide, Buddhists, and, and Christians, all of whom are recognized to be at a disadvantaged position vis-a-vis -vis the Hindu majority. And so under affirmative action, right, positions in government and education and state employment are reserved for these groups. Some groups like the Sikhs are geographically concentrated. So you find 
uh, a huge Sikh population in northwest India, in the Punjab uh, area of the north. So the kind of final category for thinking about you know, different and unique culturally distinctive groups of, of uh, Indians, we could talk about scheduled tribes and indigenous tribes or Adivasi. So these would be groups that are completely outside the, the Hindu system as well as some of those backward classes that we were talking about. About 10% of the population, so it's a smaller population of, of Indians, and it is concentrated, this population, in the north and northeast, although the, the population can be found throughout India as well. There are both scheduled tribes as well as indigenous tribes in different parts of, of India. You just find a large concentration in the north and the northeast. Again, even within these kinds of categories, we're talking about racially and linguistically discrete groups. We have people that are speakers of Austronesian languages, which you might find in the Pacific you know, Islands. You may find Austroasiatic speakers, such as you would find in Southeast Asia. You'll find the Tibetan Burman languages spoken in areas of East Asia and Southeast Asia. So very, very culturally and linguistically diverse group. Some of these tribes, particularly those called Adivasi or the indigenous tribes, are, have a special role in the sense that they are considered to be indigenous to the territories. So some tribes have their own histories and they are uh, understood to be migratory. And so the territory they currently inhabit is not the territory that they have historically been known to inhabit. Um, but there are those indigenous tribes that have consistently lived on a, on a particular territory for a continuous and extended period of time. And so it's particularly a contentious category because it is tied to special affirmative action provisions for those who are considered um, indigenous. So to quickly recap, what have we been talking about? Well, we've begun to, just like we tried to disaggregate Asia, we began to do that right with India. First, just breaking up some of the, the kind of homogenous geography into different regions, and then beginning to overlay the human uh, geography on top of that. We talked about a number of different categories of minority groups, including the scheduled right and indigenous tribes. And the point here, right, is to start this discussion about how you know, diverse India is. 